Today on Awaken to Grace, we're going to be in Psalm 103, and we are going to talk about what David meant when he wrote these incredible words. Bless the Lord, O my soul, all that is within me, bless his holy name. I'm Chad Roberts, and I'm so glad you're joining me today. If you don't know me or have never followed our ministry, you may not know that I'm completely blind. I would love for you to visit my website, awakenedtograce.com. I'd love for you to read my story and meet my family and find out a little bit about us, and I would certainly love to know more about you. You can always email me at pastorchadroberts at gmail.com. And even though I'm blind, my devices read all of my emails to me. It allows me to respond back. I would love to hear from you and where you're listening from. Well, today we're going to answer many questions like, what does it mean to bless the Lord? And what is a soul? What is a human soul? We're going to answer the questions like, does emotion belong in our worship? Is it wrong to feel emotion? Is it wrong to be led or guided by emotions? We're going to answer all of this with this simple statement that David said, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Psalm 103, it's one of my absolute favorite psalm. I wish that I could just go through the entire chapter. There's so many gems in this chapter, so many things to pull out. Unfortunately, we are only going to be in verse 1. But there are many things in Psalms 103. For example, I believe it's verse 7, if my memory serves me right. I'll just give you one quick example, then I'll get back to the text. I think it's in verse 7. The Bible says that Israel knew the acts of God, but Moses knew God's ways. Now, that's interesting. Israel knew the acts. In other words, they saw what God was doing, but Moses knew the ways of God. In other words, he understood why God was doing it. Let me tell you what to make the difference in your spiritual walk. Not just when you see what God is doing, but when you understand why he is allowing it. Amen? And so what a, there's just many gems in this chapter, many things that we could discuss. But today, for our purposes today, we're only going to be in verse 1, Psalms 103, verse 1. I love this psalm, and let's understand it today. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. What's this mean? I want to ask some questions today, and I want to answer them with the Bible. I want to ask, number one, can we bless God as humans? Do we have the ability to bless God. What does it mean to bless God? If the psalmist says, bless the Lord, and in our worship time, we say, bless the Lord, what is the true meaning of that? And what is happening in that great exchange? I want to ask this question that many churches struggle with, and I want to ask it, and I want to answer it with God's word. Is emotion part of worship? Are emotions wrong in our worship or do they belong in our worship? We're going to answer that with Scripture. I want to ask this question. We often say soul. For example, if an airplane crashes, we would say there were 140 souls on board. If a ship goes down, we'll say there were so many souls lost. But when we say soul, and when the Bible says that we are created in the image of God, what is our soul? What is it? How do you define it? 
So what my goal today, and I'm going to be a bit shorter than what I typically am. I know sometimes some of you bring a bag to lunch because I can be so long-winded. I'll be a bit shorter today because, as you know, today is above and beyond celebration. And our great brother, Matthew Browder, is going to lead us in that. And I want to give some time for that. So I'm going to be a bit shorter today. So if you're going to take notes... Hang with me because I got several things that I want you to note. I got several things I want you to learn from. My goal today is that when we leave this house of God today, your worship will be a bit different. <laughs> It'll be a bit more meaningful. It'll be a bit more impactful. It'll be a bit more significant because not my words, but the words of God will make that much of a difference in our daily worship. Bless the Lord. What did the psalmist mean? That great poet, that great songwriter, that great psalmist, that great king, that great shepherd boy. What did the psalmist mean when he says, bless the Lord? Can you and I bless God? Now, I don't think when the scripture says here, bless the Lord, I don't think it's the same transaction as when God blesses us. I think it's different. See, when we say, bless us, God, we're saying to us, help us, Lord, add to us, Lord, enrich our lives, Lord, give us your great help. If I say to you, as we so often do, God bless you, what am I saying? I'm saying, may God help you, may God enrich you, may God be with you. Now, see, in, in my little boy thinking, when I grew up, like in Sunday school, they would teach us that God created Adam and Eve because God wanted fellowship. See, in my little boy thinking, I, I interpreted that. I grew up thinking, well, God must be lonely. <laughs> God created humanity because God was lonely. You know, friends, that's not biblical teaching. God is all in all, all by himself. I, uh, some of you may not realize this, but God doesn't need you. And God most certainly does not need me. The Bible teaches in the book of Acts that God is not a man and he doesn't need to be served by human hands. You understand what I'm saying? We have the joy of partnering with God. We have the joy of serving God. But make no mistake, God does not need these hands of clay to get his work done. I am the one in need of God Almighty. God Almighty is not in need of Chad Roberts. God is not lonely today. He is all sufficient, all within himself. So what does it mean when we say, bless the Lord? Are we saying that we are enriching God? Are we saying that we are helping God? Are we saying that God is in need of anything that you and I have to offer? Absolutely not. So if you're going to take notes, I want you to note this. What does it mean to bless God? Here's literally what it means. It is like a great exclamation point to our worship. And this is literally what it means. It is an expression of gratitude. When we bless God, it is our greatest expression of our gratitude and thanksgiving for all that God has done in our life. I want you to note this. This is what it is. It is a joyful proclaiming of all that God is. Does your life reflect that? The circumstance you find yourself in right now today, if you're in a good place or you're in a difficult place, if you're in a place of need or you're in a place of abundance, if you're in a place of joy or if you're in a place of sorrow, no matter what your circumstance is, no matter what your plight is, does it reflect all that God is? Does your life say to a lost and a dying world that God is sufficient, that God is enough, that God is good, that God is gracious and God is kind and God is love and God is abundant for me? That's what blessing God means. It literally means to proclaim all that God is. It is a giant exclamation point of our praise unto the Lord. 
It is to say that God is enough in our life. It is an expression of gratitude. And let me share with you, my friends. You need to write this down. If you, if you need this today, you need to write it down so you don't forget it. Attitude is everything in life. Everything. Everything. You go to work with a bad attitude, it's going to hold you back. You go through your marriage with a bad attitude, always critical, always complaining, always negative, it's going to hold you back. Your friendships, you look around your life, you're always negative, it's going to hold you back. You know, there's two kinds of people in this world. There are those that make people smile when they walk into a room. And there's those who make people smile when they walk out of the room. (laughs) Which are you? I heard one time about an older lady. She always kept her overcoat over her couch, over the arm of her couch. And one day, someone asked her, said, why don't you ever hang your coat up? And she said, well, I keep it there so that if some, because she said it depends on who comes by. She said, if I like them, I say, oh, I just got in. Or if I don't like them, I say, oh, I was just leaving. (laughs) Attitude is everything. And so it is with the Lord. You can love God. You can memorize the word. You can know all the worship songs. You can come to church every week. But if your attitude is bad... You're not pleasing to the Lord. You're not going to grow as the Lord intends you to grow. Attitude is everything. Boy, I learn that more and more the older my kids get. Hallelujah. Sadie will tell our girls, tone and presentation. (laughs) Watch your tone. Watch your presentation. Attitude is everything. And when we say, bless the Lord, it's our attitude. It is an expression of our gratitude to the Lord. Now, let me ask this. Does emotion belong in worship? Is emotion part of worship? You know, for my two cents, for whatever that's worth, I believe there are two ditches to every road. And at this church, I'll just tell you, we always aim for the double yellow lines. We never want to be in a ditch in anything. We always, uh, uh, Terry Whitson always taught me, Chad, blessed are the balanced. Always be balanced. And what I see in so many of our brothers and sisters, I see some churches that are in this ditch, they're cold, they're dead. They're like a cemetery to the world. No life, no praise, no joy, no emotion. And then I see on the other side of the ditch, some churches are like a sane asylums. You ever been to a crazy church? If you don't know, then you ain't never been to a crazy church. And if you have, you know you've been to a crazy church because it can be crazy. Anybody with me? I was telling the 9 a.m. crew that uh, a friend of mine preached at a church in Kentucky one time, and there was a large choir loft, and a woman fell out of the choir loft, and her robe went up over her head, and she just laid there, and no one helped her. And my friend thought, is she dead? Did she snap her neck? What's going on? And... uh, (laughs) He asked the pastor, he said, is anyone going to help her? And the pastor said, oh, she does it all the time. (laughs) What? (laughs) There's some crazy churches, some crazy Christians. But let's answer this biblically. Does emotion belong in worship? I believe the biblical answer is absolutely yes. Why? Why? 
Because God created us with emotions. Emotions are part of God's design of us. God himself has emotions. In his holiness, in his perfection, he feels love as well as anger. He feels jealousy. Is the Lord not jealous over us? Yet he's without sin. Our problem is our emotions are tainted with sin. That's our problem. But emotions are not wrong. And do they belong in our worship? Well, listen to what the psalmist said. Bless the Lord, O my soul. This little word, O, right here, mightily important because it adjusts our thinking. The word O right here literally is an interjection of emotion. So right here it is in the text, as though I have a Bible here. You know what I mean. Right there, it, <laughs> right there it is in the text. Bless the Lord. Oh, the emotion of our worship. Friends, if you don't feel anything when you read the word, something's wrong. If you don't feel anything when you pray and worship God, something's wrong. God ought to move Our emotions. Now, there's a difference between emotionalism and emotion. You understand? You might want to note that. There is emotion and then there is emotionalism. What's the difference? Emotionalism is sensationalism. I have no interest in sensationalism. But I do have interest in feeling the weightiness. And feeling the goodness of God in my life. You see the difference? It's like tradition and traditionalism. Is tradition wrong? No. I'm an avid Tennessee volunteer fan. You can feel sorry for me. It's been a rough decade. But one of our traditions is the checkered board end zone, right? I wouldn't be real happy if they messed with that tradition. It shouldn't matter. I'm blind. But anyway, it would still. I would not be happy if they changed our tradition. Nothing wrong with tradition. Nothing wrong with honoring tradition. Where we get wrong in the church is when we take our traditions and we put them above Jesus. Where we get wrong is when we take our traditions and put them above fellowship. I don't, I, listen, if I don't fellowship with you because my preferences are, di- are different, then that's traditionalism. That's legalism. It's okay for me to love my tradition. What's not okay is for me to put my tradition above you or our fellowship or Jesus. That's traditionalism. You see the difference? And so it is an emotion. I love to feel emotion. It's good. It's good. But I'm not to be controlled by emotions. That's emotionalism. So does emotion belong in our worship? The biblical answer is yes. Now what's he mean by soul? Bless the Lord. What is that? That's the expression of our gratitude. That is the joyful proclamation of all that God is. Oh, the emotion of it. Bless the Lord. Oh, my soul. What what is a soul? The soul is the immaterial part of our being. It is the part of us that is created in the image of God. God didn't create us in his image as in hands or nose or eyes or ears. God is a spirit Isn't that what scripture teaches? God is a spirit. How did God create us? As a spirit. That's why when we die, when this flesh dies, our soul departs to be with the Lord if you're born again. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. C.S. Lewis so wonderfully said, you are not a body that has a soul. You are a soul That happens to have a body. That's why though the outward man is wasting away, 
The inward man is being renewed day by day. Amen? Because who you truly are is your soul. That's who you are. Now, what is a soul? A soul is our mind, not our brain, our mind, the way we think. It is our mind, our will, and our emotions. That's our soul. The mind, the will, and the emotions. So let's evaluate just a little bit. When it comes to worshiping the Lord, are we worshiping God with our minds? Are we worshiping with our will? And are we worshiping with our emotions? I want to explain that for a moment. But note this first of all. This is why this verse means so much to me. Bless the Lord. We know what that is now, right? It's our attitude of gratitude. It's our expression of gratitude. We know that emotions are part of worship because that word O is the interjection of emotion. We understand now what the soul is. It's the mind, the will, and emotions. And now this is exactly what the psalmist meant when he said, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Do you see what David meant? All that is within me, my mind, my will, and my emotions. All that is me, all of me, bless the Lord. See, what we do so often, follow me right now. Now, we're very expressive here, and I love that. We clap. I love that. Boy, when you guys break out clapping, it just, I love it. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) But we clap to the Lord, right? We clap to the Lord. We don't clap to clay feet. Amen? I don't care if it's me or whoever is on this stage. We clap to the Lord. Not to clay hands and clay feet. Amen? I love it when we shout. I love it when we amen. I love it when we sing loud. Those are expressions of worship. But follow me right now. Those are outward expressions of worship. Where worship is to truly originate is inward. And you see what happens when I begin to worship from my mind. When I begin to worship out of my will. When I begin to worship out of my emotions. What is inward then turns outward. What is inward comes out through my vocal cords. What is inward comes out through the lifting of my hands. What is inward comes out by clapping to the Lord. What is inward comes out as tears unto God. What is inward then comes outward. The outward is not first. The inward is first followed by the outward. Can we say amen to that? Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all. All mind, will, and emotions that are within me. So let's understand this, and then I'll begin to... We're going to start to land the plane. All right, we're going to... Smooth landing here. (laughs) Our mind. What's it mean to worship God out of your mind? See, what the Word of God does in our life, it transforms us by the renewing of our mind. It changes. What, what does the Bible say? Think on these things. See, there's so many people. The lion's share of their thinking is the past. No, that's not godly. For some people, the lion's share of their thinking is the future. And the problems that await, or the worries of tomorrow, or the anxieties. No, do you know what godly thinking is? Godly thinking is when you think on the good things of God. It's when you think on God's holiness. You think on His perfection. You think on His justice, and His sovereignty, and His righteousness, and all of the wonderful attributes of who God is. That's good thinking. 
Good thinking, godly thinking, is when you think of God's mercy and grace over your life. It's when you think of God's goodness and mercy that's pursuing you all the days of your life. That's good, godly thinking. Do you worship God in your thinking? Are your thoughts filled with lust? Are your thoughts filled with unforgiveness? Are your thoughts filled with conflict with others? Let me tell you how you know you're in trouble in your thinking. It's when you start having imaginary conversations. And we all do it, don't we? We all have those people that we don't say what we would like to say, right? And we do these imaginary converse, and they, and they replay, and they replay, and they replay. And you know what it creates? It creates a cycle of spiritual hindrances. If you will begin to worship God out of your thinking, out of the way that you think, what a transformation that will come to your daily life. Thinking godly worship, an act of worship by thinking is when you read, you study, you meditate, and you apply the word of God to your daily life. What a difference it makes. Secondly, an act of the will. Why is worship so important out of the will? Because let's just be honest for a moment. Do you always feel like being spiritual? Do you always feel like praying? Do you always feel like going to church? No. I've shared with you one of the battles I have is getting my butt on a treadmill. God convicted me and said, you need to be on that treadmill every day. Why? Because where I'm blind, I sit all day. And even when I do walk, I'll walk two miles an hour. Boy, I get on that treadmill, and it is, I'm like, oh, I'm walking normal. It's amazing. I love being on my treadmill. You know what my problem is? Getting on the treadmill. That's my problem. And before you throw stones at me, let's just get honest. You you love being in church. What's your problem? Uh Getting to church, right? But when we're here, we love it. (laughs) Throw stones at me for getting (laughs) on. I'm kidding. This past week has been such a busy week. Going into Easter was so busy. And this week has been the busiest week I've had yet in blindness. And I did not get on my treadmill one single time this week. But see, as important as it is, and it is, God told me to do it. It's important. But listen, here's what the Bible says. Paul said, bodily exercise profits little. But godly exercise is great gain. See, I can afford to miss a few days on my treadmill. What I can't afford is to miss worshiping God. That's That's critical. That's vital. That's everything. Because let me tell you something. I can walk five miles a day, but one day this flesh will die. My soul will never die. And it's the number one thing. And so it is with you. Do you care for it? Are you taking care of it? Are you nurturing it? Are you feeding it? Are you good to it? And see, the reason why worship out of our will matters so much is because sometimes you don't feel like being spiritual. That's where your will kicks in. Sometimes you don't feel like coming to church, but that's where your will kicks in. Sometimes you don't feel like giving. Sometimes you don't feel like praying. Sometimes you don't feel like singing to the Lord, but that's where your will kicks in. 
And let me tell you, when worship, when you invite worshiping God into your will, you're going to be a steady, steady Christian. Do you worship God out of your will? Because this is what the psalmist is talking about. All that is within me, my way of thinking, my will, how important it is. And then lastly, our emotions. Do we worship God from our emotions? Now, this is interesting, and I want you to follow me for a moment, okay? Let me teach just a second here. We are to worship God from our emotions, but we're not to be controlled by our emotions. Let me show you what emotions are. Now, they're God-given, and they're good. But uh, this past week, as, as many of you know, our beloved brother, Michael Bollinger, passed away Wednesday. He was a deacon here at our church, and he and Joy were at MD Anderson in Jacksonville, Florida. I talked to Joy last Sunday night, and the Holy Spirit just said, you need to go. You need to go pray for Michael. The doctors said that he probably wouldn't make it through Friday at MD Anderson. And I called our lead deacon, Brett, and I said, Brett, uh, I've got to go to Jacksonville. And Brett said, I'm going to take a couple days off of work, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to take you. I'm going with you. We were going to go Wednesday or Thursday or Friday. And Brett called me back and he said, Chad, the Holy Spirit just won't, won't let me. He said, I feel the Lord saying, we got to go now. So we left Monday to go down to Jacksonville. <clears throat> we relied on our GPS. And as you know, our brother passed Wednesday. Boy, wasn't that the Holy Spirit speaking to Brett? If we had waited, it would have been... But no, we went. We spent about two and a half hours with him uh, Tuesday morning, oh, before I left, Michael had no strength, and he squeezed my hand as hard as he could. Glory to God. When we left, he was sitting up in his bed with his eyeglasses on, fully alert. Thank God he allowed us to spend some time with him. Well, today, Brett and Tim and I are leaving right after church, and I'll do the memorial service tomorrow. As a matter of fact, it will be live streamed on our church Facebook page at 11 a.m. if you would like to join in. So we're down in Jacksonville. I'm not going to say Brett isn't a good navigation person, but I will say we relied on our GPS. I can tell you some stories. You can see me afterward. And we relied on the GPS. But let me tell you what we didn't rely on. We didn't rely on the gas tank to tell us where to go. All the gas needle does is tell us when to fill up. It doesn't tell us what to do. Say amen if you're with me right now. I'm going somewhere with this. Your emotions are not wrong. But when you let them guide you. It, that becomes wrong. Your emotions are like a gauge. It's like a gas hand. Your emotions simply tell you how you feel. It does not tell you what to do. Where people get in trouble is when they're led, when they're guided by emotion. No. Emotion simply tells me how I feel. So if I'm sad this morning, I'm not wrong for feeling sad. If I'm jealous today, the jealousy, the the emotion of jealousy is not wrong. If I'm angry today, I'm not wrong for how I feel. I'm wrong for how I respond. And like a gas hand, if I'm angry today, what that gas hand is telling me, no, Chad, you need to be filled up with the love of Christ. You need God to do something in your life right now. If you're sad today, I need to be comforted by Christ. But it doesn't tell me what to do. The GPS of God's word tells me what to do. The GPS of the Holy Spirit guides me and tells me what to do, not the gas hand. 
So if some of you would flip that today, and instead of being led, instead of being directed by your emotions, just let your emotions tell you what you need from the Lord. And then you go to God and say, God, I'm wrestling with jealousy. God, I'm wrestling with greed. God, I'm wrestling with lust. God, I'm struggling today with anger. I'm struggling today, God, with loneliness or with sadness. I need to be filled up by you. And then the truth of God's word guides you and tells you what to do. Can we say amen to that? So do you see how this is supposed to work? We express our gratitude to God. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, my mind, my will, and my emotions. And I'll say this as they come to, to, to close us today. A wonderful book that I read that I enjoyed, I would recommend it to you. It's called The Disciplines of a Godly Man. In this wonderful book... A pastor noted how he began to pray, and it's always stuck with me. He said, you know, when I begin to pray, my body doesn't always want to cooperate. It's tired. It's fatigued. He said, my emotions rarely want to cooperate. But he said, let me tell you what I've learned. He said, I've learned how to pray out of my will. And he said, here's what I did. And I thought it was so funny the way he said it, but it really stuck with me. He said, when me and my will decide we're going to pray, my body and emotions eventually get in line. (laughs) And some of you, that's what you need to do today. You need to say, my will is going to worship the Lord and my emotions will soon follow. But I'm not going to be led any longer by my emotions. I'm going to be led by the Holy Spirit and through His Word, it's going to be an act of my thinking. It's going to be an act of my will and it's going to be an act of my emotions. And when we get all that straight, everything else will straighten up from there. Amen.